Well, greetings, everyone. This is Amal Matu with this week's resuscitation video cast. This week, we're going to review a lecture that was done by uh, Dr. Scott Bronstein. Scott is an attending physician at Cedar Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, and every year, Cedar Sinai hosts a really great emergency medicine CME symposium called the Cedar Sinai Emergency Medicine Symposium, and uh, it's a great conference. This past year, in 2011, Scott gave a lecture that was designed to update everybody on the 2010 guidelines on how we're supposed to be managing intracranial hemorrhage. It's certainly something that we in emergency medicine have to know uh, inside and out, upside down, backwards, forwards, left and right. It's something that we've got to know. It's an important part of our specialty. And those guidelines address some controversial topics. For example, uh, when do you treat seizures? And should you prophylax for seizures? How do you treat hypertension and, and a handful of other things? So I'm going to pass things over to Scott, and he's going to educate all of us on this very, very important topic. So a lot of this guide is based, this, this talk is based on these guidelines, published in 2010 in the Journal of Stroke. The American Heart Association and American Stroke Association got together their experts and came up based on the most recent data uh, with their recommend, recommendations for treatment of this disorder. Now, the previous guidelines came out in 2007, but because there have been some significant clinical studies published since then, they actually got together and decided to update their, their guidelines sooner than they otherwise would have. Etiologies include age, and we know that the risk of this doubles every decade after age 50. Hypertension is the most common cause, and these tend to cause bleeds which are deeper in the brain and in or around the basal ganglia. Anticoagulant use is a rising cause, and we know that the use of anti oral anticoagulants has increased fourfold over the last decade. Cerebral am amyloid angiopathy is a disease of older people involving protein plaques which are deposited in the blood vessels of the brain, making them leaky, and substance abuse. The classic clinical presentation is sudden onset of severe headache, vomiting, and a rapid decrease in level of consciousness, usually over minutes, sometimes hours. And these patients often present with systolic blood pressures that are very high, often above 220. Now, two-thirds of these occur in the area deep in the brain, in or around the basal ganglia, um, namely the, the caudate, putamen, and the thalamus. This is a little bit hard to read. Um, and the, uh, these usually come from leakage of tributaries from the middle cerebral artery, which, which penetrates that area there. Uh, about 30% occur in the frontal lobe, and a small amount occur in the brain stem, actually not in the frontal lobe, but in but our lobar and about um, a smaller percentage occur in the brainstem and cerebellum. The strongest predictors that we have from observational studies of a poor prognosis include low GCS, less than or equal to eight, larger hematoma volumes, especially above 60 mLs, the presence of intraventricular blood, older age, especially above age 80, and brainstem bleeds. Now, we interviewed several of our staff neurosurgeons in preparing this talk, and they asked me to include this slide. Because when we consult them, this is really what they want to know. And they feel that we don't always tell them up front what they're looking for. The most important piece of clinical information they want is the GCS. And we're very good at calculating this in our heads, but it's not always the first thing that we tell them. There's also a modified GCS score for intubated patients. They also want to know what the pupils look like. Are they symmetric and reactive? And preferably before we paralyze and intubate them, if that's clinically possible. When you describe the CT to them, they want to know the location, the size, whether there's any midline shift, any intraventricular blood, or any subarachnoid blood. In terms of medications that the patient is on, we're very good at knowing who's on Coumadin or anticoagulants. We often don't ask about antiplatelet agents, including aspirin and Plavix, even NSAIDs. And an order that they would like us to consider up front, at least at our hospital, is a rapid platelet function assay. Um, we'll talk more about platelets in a few minutes. So I think that's pretty useful information. It's always useful to know what our consultants are going to want to know about. And this was a little bit of a surprise to me. You know, the platelet assay I never even thought about uh, mentioning before or testing for. But if it's something that they're going to be very interested in, then it might be worth talking to the neurosurgeons about at your hospital and at my hospital to find out whether that's something that they want. And also the GCS, you know, to be honest with you, I learned that the GCS was primarily just something that was used in trauma patients, not so much for these spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage patients, 
But again, this is another thing that I'm going to talk to the neurosurgeons about and find out if that's what they want. The other thing that Scott mentioned is that they want to know where the bleed is and oftentimes the neurosurgeons want to know how big the bleed is and they want to know when we talk about how big it is, how much volume is there in that bleed. And I've never really had a good sense about how to calculate that. And Scott's going to talk about how exactly we can calculate the volume of the bleed. So this is how the neurosurgeons calculate what the, the volume is uh, of the bleed. And it's basically A times B times C divided by 2, where A is the longest axis of the bleed, B is the longest axis perpendicular to that line, both in centimeters, and C is the number of slices it's seen on times the slice thickness. And what you get is cubic centimeters, which is equal to milliliters. And this is how they, they estimate the size of the bleed and volume. Well, here's a growing issue. A lot of our patients and a lot of your patients are on oral anticoagulants or antiplatelet drugs when they have their spontaneous bleed. How do you treat those patients? So we know that about 14% of patients with ICH are on oral anticoagulants. We also know that patients on these medicines have a significant increased risk of hematoma expansion, and patients on Coumadin have double the mortality of patients who are not on Coumadin when they come in with this condition. Now, the gold standard for treatment has always been uh, fresh frozen plasma plus IV vitamin K. And what's new on the horizon are these PCCs, which Dr. Trabadi spoke of earlier, prothrombin compl uh, con complex concentrates. Um, and basically, these, have, these are plasma-derived factor concentrates, mainly factors 10, 9, 7, and 2. And um, they, they have several obvious advantages over FFP in that they're readily available. They don't require thawing or cross-matching. They also can be given in much smaller volumes than FFP, and they're less likely to transmit infection. But unfortunately, at this point, there's only one small study and some case reports comparing the two head-to-head, -head, PCCs and FFP. And what they found, which we know, is a much more rapid correction of INR. PCCs correct the INR usually within minutes, uh, but they were not able to study so far. I've not been able to show a difference in clinical outcome. Now, recombinant factor 7 was something that in the 2007 guidelines was spoken of rather neutrally or described as investigational. But phase three studies that have come out since then have actually showed that while they're able to decrease hematoma expansion, they have, were not able to show any difference in clinical outcome. And there was nearly a three times the increased risk of thromboembolic disease and especially arterial thrombo thrombotic problems at the higher doses. In terms of platelets, there's, there's really not much controversy that patients with low platelets or a thrombocytopenic with ICH should get platelet transfusion. But where there's controversy is what to do about patients that have a normal platelet number but have platelet dysfunction, either due to medical conditions and more often antiplatelet drugs. And there were two articles in 2009 that had somewhat contradictory results. Uh, Sansing looked at 282 patients, 70 of which were on antiplatelet agents, and he did not find any difference in hemorrhage volume, expansion, or clinical outcome at 90 days. NIDEC took 68 patients and actually measured the platelet function assay on all of these patients. And he did find that decreased platelet activity was associated with early ICH volume growth and worse functional outcome. And what I think is interesting about this is that while 23 patients were known to be on, anti, on aspirin or antiplatelet agents, another 16 actually was found to have decreased platelet function as if they were on aspirin. And likely these people had taken maybe possibly some over-the-counter or other antiplatelet agent. Uh, he did transfuse plat platelets to these patients and was not able to show a clinical outcome. But I would note that the platelet transfusion in his study took place about 21 hours on average after symptom onset. And I know at our hospital we're able to get them platelets a lot sooner than that, possibly would have better findings. So the guideline recommendations, if the patient is coagulopathic or thrombocytopenic, they should receive replacement. If the patient um, is, has an elevated INR due to oral anticoagulants, you should give uh, vitamin K-dependent factor replacement and IV vitamin K. And they say that though PCCs have not been shown to improve outcome compared with FFP, they may have fewer complications or are a reasonable alternative, and that's a class 2A recommendation. So basically making us free to, to give P, uh, PCCs for these patients. Uh, they say that factor 7 is not recommended pretty much under any circumstances. And they state that platelet infusions for patients on antiplatelet agents is still considered investigational. Now, this is different than what most of the neurosurgeons are doing at our hospital. The ones I spoke to feel that physiologically it makes sense that giving 
platelets that work to these patients would be helpful, and that the studies have not shown any adverse effects. So our, our neurosurgeons are pretty liberal about transfusing platelets for these patients, even the ones who aren't known to be on agents but have a platelet dysfunction on their platelet function assay. One of the two biggest quandaries in managing these patients is how do you manage severe hypertension? So many of these patients have baseline hypertension to start with, and when they come in, they are even more hypertensive. Do you bring it down abruptly? How much do you bring it down? Do you just let it ride? What do the guidelines say about that, Scott? In terms of blood pressure, we've known for a long time, based on some large studies, including this study uh, from China, including seven, 1,760 patients with ICH, that there's pretty much a linear relationship between presenting systolic blood pressure and risk of, di of death and disability. Um, the study below was a meta-analysis uh, of 3,000 patients. But what we haven't known is, is it safe to lower these patients' blood pressures acutely? And how much should we lower their blood pressure? This was the 2007 recommendation. Uh, until ongoing clinical trials of blood pressure intervention for ICH are complete, physicians must manage blood pressure on the basis of the present incomplete efficacy evidence. Current suggested recommendations may be considered. And basically, they're saying that we don't know. And they list these somewhat confusing recommendations, um, but they state at the bottom these are class C, basically based on, on, on consensus opinion and without any evidence. So what's new is we have two trials that have come out since the last guidelines. The INTERACT trial, which stands for Intensive Blood Pressure Reduction in Acute Cerebral Hemorrhage. This was a Chinese trial that looked at 404 patients and randomized them using IV blood pressure lowering agents to either a systolic of 140 or a systolic of 180, keeping it there for the first 24 hours. And what they found was a significant decrease in hematoma growth of 13% in the, in the lower blood pressure group compared to 36% at the higher blood pressure group. And importantly, they also found no adverse effects. Now, they weren't able to show clinical outcome improvement, but the study wasn't powered to do so. The other study is the ATTACH trial, which stands for Antihypertensive uh, agents in cerebral hemorrhage, which just came out in 2010. In this study, they took 60 patients and ran, uh, that had blood pressures greater than 170 systolic and ICH and randomized them using IV nicardipine to reach one of three blood pressure goals, systolics of 110 to 139, 140 to 169, and 170 to 199. And you'll notice that these studies are usually using systolic blood pressure, which is found to correlate better than mean arterial or diastolic pressures. And what they found was a trend toward less hematoma expansion, less perihematoma edema, and better three-month outcomes for the lower blood pressure group, though this did not meet statistical significance. They also found that patients who were treated early, less than three hours, and patients that had a higher blood pressures on arrival above 200 actually did better, and there were no adverse effects. So we have these two studies, which are good, not great, uh, they don't show any statistical significant, statistically significant clinical outcome um, improvement, but at least there's a trend towards improvement and, um, and there were not adverse effects. And based on these two studies, the most recent recommendation is that in patients with systolic blood pressures of 150 to 220, acute lowering of systolic blood pressure to 140 is probably safe, and that's a class 2A recommendation. All right, sounds good. So go ahead and be gentle with it, but go ahead and treat the blood pressure. The other big quandary in managing these patients has to do with seizure prophylaxis. Who are the patients that you need to start on anti-epileptic medications? In terms of seizures, we know that up to 17% of patients will have clinical seizures in the first two weeks after ICH. And if you include people monitored with EEGs who have subclinical seizures, the number is up to 30 uh, percent. We know that seizures in this condition do lead to a worse, uh, to worse outcome, and there isn't controversy, again, that patients with seizures, clinical or subclinical, should be treated with anti-epileptic agents. Where the controversy has arisen has been about prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs for these patients who are not yet seizing. And there were two studies which should give us pause about doing this, both from 2009 uh, Messe uh, looked at 295 patients and noted that if patients received prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs, and these were pretty much all dilantin or phenytoin, the odds ratio was seven times of being dead or disabled at 90 days, and this was statistically significant. NIDEC, the same year, took 98 patients and noted that 
phenytoin use specifically was associated independently with more fever and worse functional outcomes at two weeks, one month, and three months. Incidentally, a smaller number of the patients in that study were on Keppra, and these patients did not show a negative clinical outcome. So the guideline recommendations are that patients with clinical seizures or seizures on EEG should receive anti-epileptic drugs, and that's a class one recommendation. They also state that patients who have degree of mental status out of proportion to the size of a bleed should receive continuous EEG monitoring, because we know that a lot of these patients could have seizures as a cause. And their final recommendation is that prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs should not be used. And in talking, talking to our neurosurgeons again, uh, they haven't all bought in on this. And um, the consensus seems to be that patients that have bleeds deeper in the brain, in the area of the basal ganglia, which are most of them, these patients are a lot less likely to seize, and they're pretty much comfortable not treating with prophylactic anti-epileptic agents. But patients who have cortical bleeds, especially large cortical bleeds, most of the neurosurgeons still, uh, that I talked to still are uh, recommending anti-epileptic agents. We're using actually a lot more Keppra rather than Dilantin now, and it's probably based on, on the studies I showed you. Well, I think Scott did a really great lecture of summarizing the key points of those guidelines. I'm going to go ahead and include his full summary of his talk. And this summary is going to include some of the points that we didn't cover in this little snippet of his talk. If you want to get his full talk, just go to CME Download, and you can get the details behind some of the points that he's summarizing that we didn't cover. So, Scott, why don't you go ahead and sum things up for us. So, a summary of just the Class 1 and 2A recommendations. They state that non-contrast head CT should be done as soon as possible. CTA or MRA may be useful to evaluate for secondary lesions when suspicious. Patients who are deficient in coagulation factors or platelets should receive replacement. Patients with elevated INRs on Coumadin should receive vitamin K-dependent factors, either PCCs or FFP, and intravenous vitamin K. PCCs, though they have not been shown to improve outcome, they likely will have fewer complications and are considered a safe alternative. Patients with systolic blood pressures of 150 to 220, it's probably safe to acutely lower them down to 140. Patients with clinical seizures or seizures on EEG should receive anti-epileptic agents. Continuous EEG monitoring uh, is, is suggested when mental status is suppressed out of proportion to the size of the bleed. Patients with cerebellar bleeds and clinical deterioration or brainstem compression should have surgery as soon as possible, and new DNR orders should be delayed until the second hospital day. All right, once again, that was Dr. Scott Bronstein speaking from the Cedar sinai Emergency Medicine Symposium. It's a great conference, and he did a great job summarizing those intracranial hemorrhage guidelines. If you want the full talk, once again, you can get that off CME download. I'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Until then, take care.